Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for the leadership development tonight. We're asking, Lord, that you grant us understanding and grant us abundant grace that will be doers of the word in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, to be stronger and to have a brighter vision as we lead your people in the right direction in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. you can see that we're coming to Exodus chapter 19, and I'm reading from verse 3. Please open your Bible, Exodus chapter 19, verse 3. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, reading from verse 4, this is what you'll tell them, ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Verse 5. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then it shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Verse 6, in verse 6, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. As we look at those verses, we see that God already established a relationship between himself and the children of Israel. Relationship individually, relationship nationally, relationship individually. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. He dealt with them on individual basis. Each family was to take a lamb and kill the lamb to be a substitute for them. And they would apply the blood on the lintels of their houses. And everyone individually would stay inside the house under the cover and the covering and the cleansing of the blood of the lamb. If anyone came out individual, if anyone came out, the angel of death will slay him, will destroy him. And so individually, they saw that it is through the blood they were saved. It's through the blood they were protected. Their security was based on the blood. And now, after he had saved them, all of them together, they came out of the land of Egypt. And they were going on their way to the promised land. Now he came to them, he said he was giving them a law. And this law will make them a nation separated from all the other nations. And he said, if you will indeed obey my voice. Now when he said that, he said that to individuals. Each person was to uh, keep the commandment of the law. Law. When it says you'll not have any other God, it said that to every individual, it said that to the nation. You'll not call the name of the Lord in vain. It said that to every individual, it said that to the nation. When it said you'll keep the Sabbath, the day of rest, it said that to individual, it said that to the nation. We need to understand then as we look at the commandments of the Lord, as he gave to the children of Israel, the individual one and then the nation and so you'll be a peculiar people that's the nation a holy nation unto me that is a nation and it will be a kingdom of priests who was talking to the nation then and so as we look at the commandments of the lord we look at it on the basis of the individual that looks at the commandment and it says that is given to me and then to the nation that is given 
giving to the nation when he says you will not make any kind of negotiation with them any agreement with them you will not worship their idol he said that to the individual he said that to the nation please mark that number two when god gave his commandment you know sometimes we misread the bible and we misinterpret the bible well, if we say because of depravity the they could not obey the word of god that's there's a contradiction there god who knew them gave them a commandment now if god gave a commandment that they could not keep he knew they could not keep it and then he gave them the commandment that would be unjust god it's a just God. When God says, honor your father and your mother, and you say, I'm sorry, I can't do that, God. I have depravity. When God says, thou shalt not steal, I'm sorry, God, I can't do that because I have depravity. And when it says, thou shalt not kill, God, I'm sorry I cannot obey that because you know I have depravity. There's a contradiction there. He knows you can do it. He knows that this, you have the ability. He has redeemed you. He has saved you. He brought you out of darkness. He brought you out of that uh, kind of uh, incapacity of the human nature. And then you go and say, oh God, but you know me now. I can't do that. He said, if you will indeed obey my voice. And then he said, if you do not obey now, how can God punish somebody? for he couldn't do it god he had depravity god he had the impossibility oh god he cannot keep your commandments so why are you going to punish him he punished them because he knew they could do it god is a just god he had prepared them he has enabled them he had empowered them and if they do not use what they already have in waiting for what they ought to have and what they will have they will be punished for that Noah build an ark for your house because I'm going to destroy the whole world oh God but you know now I cannot do that I have human depravity he would have perished God said build an ark you can if you couldn't he wouldn't tell you don't steal you can if you don't he wouldn't if you couldn't he wouldn't have told you do not commit adultery you can decease from adultery in every shape and form if you could not he would not have told you that's why we're looking today at the message saved by grace the grace of god was available for them sanctified for godliness and sanctification was available for them even the old testament search for glory that the message today we're looking at saved by grace sanctified for godliness and search for glory we're looking at this under three subtitles number one saved by grace to be his workmanship he saved them he saves us and now he's worked on the inside of us he's worked on our heart and we are now his workmanship number two sanctified for godliness in this world sanctified for godliness in this world please don't forget that in the old testament we have enoch sanctified for godliness in this world please don't forget in the old testament we have isaiah that the fire of the lord came and purged his heart and the punching of the heart made him to do the will of god from here don't forget we have samuel and we have um, we have uh, we have daniel we have shadrach meshach and abednego in the old testament don't forget that the grace of god was available for them sanctified for godliness in this world number three satisfied with goodness beyond 
the wilderness. The promises he gave them to heal them, to help them, to deliver them, to protect them, to give them the victory over all their enemies in the Old Testament, the goodness of the Lord, they were satisfied with that in the wilderness and beyond the wilderness. Three things. Number one, saved. Number two, sanctified. Number three, satisfied. Number one, saved by grace. Number two, sanctified for godliness. And number three, satisfied with goodness, both in the wilderness and beyond the wilderness. We're looking at number one now. Number one, saved by grace to be his workmanship. In Exodus chapter 9, already we've seen that he said you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles wings and brought you unto myself in verse 5 it says because of that now therefore if ye will obey don't say you cannot you can if ye will obey even in the Old Testament he enabled them he helped them he lifted them up and he made them to live a life of obedience. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, then ye shall be destroyed by the edge of the sword. For the Lord has said it. Now he tells us, he said, now therefore if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, don't say you can't, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me, a Above all people, for all the earth is mine. Look at verse 6. In verse 6 it says, He shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. The, when that one is holy and that one is holy and that family is holy and everybody and every family is holy and they make up the nation, it says you'll be an holy nation. These are the words which thou shall speak unto the children of Israel. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 2 and I'm reading from verse 8. It says, For by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. In verse 9, it says not of works lest any man should boast. Look at verse 10. It says, For we are his workmanship. We are his workmanship. He works in us. He recreates us. He transforms us. He changes us through and through, within and without. We're now his workmanship. We are saved to be his workmanship. And then he says, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we shall walk in them. Look at thirty things here. Number one, we're looking at the redemption of the saved by God's great love. Number two, the righteousness with salvation from a grateful gracious life and then he tells us in, a, in number three now the reality of selflessness in good guiltless living look at number one number one is the redemption of the saved by god's great love how are they saved what they say by their own works is each because you know they presented their marriage before the Lord, they were saved. Deuteronomy chapter 7, we're looking at verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 7, reading from verse 6 For thou art an holy people, separated people, righteous people, unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God has chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Look at verse 7. In verse 7 it says, The Lord did not set his love 
upon you nor choose you because you are more in number than any people for ye were the fewest of all people he said the lord has not given you that salvation that forgiveness and calling you and lifting you and bringing you to himself because you had any special quality because you are more in number than the people he said no look at verse 8 in verse 8 it tells us but because the Lord loved you, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting love. It's the mercy of God, it's the love of God, it's the grace of God. The same way they were brought out of their slavery and they were brought into the salvation of the Lord. The same way we were brought out of our slavery to sin and were brought to the salvation of the Lord. But because the Lord loved you and because he would keep his oath which he had sworn unto your fathers because the heavenly father will keep his covenant with his only begotten son that he will come die for us and whosoever will come to the father through him will be saved the same thing is because of his covenant with his only begotten son he, he says as the lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you he redeemed you with a mighty and that same hand and that same power abides with the, abides with us as it abode with them. Now that he gave them commandment, they cannot say, Oh Lord, but you know we're human beings, you know we're weak, you know we can do nothing. You can because already his mighty hand, his mighty power has saved you out of the house of bond men from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. The Lord did it for them. The Lord will do it for you. And he'll give you the strength. And you'll never, you know, stay in a corner again. Oh Lord, I'm falling into sin again. But you know, you know me, I'm a human being. I couldn't have do, done anything less. I'm a sinner. Uh-uh. You must be saved. You must be redeemed. And when you are redeemed and you are saved, the grace to do the will of God and the grace to obey the word of God comes into you. Everyone, you'll have the abundance of the grace of God. We're looking at Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 4 in Titus chapter 3 verse 4 but after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared in verse 5 it tells us not by the works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy he saved us like he saved them the sister light according to his love or merited mercy it says by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the holy ghost look at verse 6 in verse 6 which he shed on us abundantly he didn't uh, you know give us the grace in such a little way that you you know lord the grace you give me is not enough and i couldn't overcome yes you gave me grace but it wasn't enough you showed love to me it wasn't enough you gave me strength it wasn't enough you'll never be able to accuse god of giving you grace insufficient at your salvation it says which is shared on us abundantly through jesus christ our savior then he says in verse 7 that being justified by his grace we should be made as according to the hope of eternal life and then in verse 8 it says this is a faithful saying and these things i will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain 
good works. We cannot say, I cannot maintain good works. I cannot do good towards my neighbor. I cannot love my neighbor. And I cannot obey the commandments of God. I cannot honor my father, my mother. I cannot do without stealing. And adultery, I, I want to avoid it, but I cannot because I am weak, nothing like that. It says, the preacher, the pastor, the teacher of the word of God will be very careful to tell the people who are born again will maintain good works. It says these things are good and profitable unto men. We're looking at number two. Number two, we're looking at the righteousness with salvation for a grateful, gracious life. You see, as we're saved, as Christ has given himself for us, and he has taken our punishment of all the past sin, number one, we become grateful that God will do that for me. I am grateful. Look at the children of Israel, that God will take them out of bondage and then get them through, through the Red Sea, open the Red Sea, and all of them, young and old, boy and girl, man and woman, parents and children, they all went through the Red Sea. They were sinking on the other side of the Red Sea. They were grateful. That gratitude should reflect in our behavior, reflect in our character, and then a gracious life. Now we live a gracious life because of what he has done. That's the reason why he gave them now the commandment. We're looking at Exodus chapter 20, and I'm reading from verse 1. Exodus chapter 20 verse 1, and God spake all these words all these commandments we're going to read now, God spake all these words, number one up to number ten, God spake these words, and these words, they're, they're not, uh, they're not uh, words that can be cancelled. They're not words that can be overlooked. They're not words that forget about that. We're now in the new covenant. Can I tell you something now? Jesus Christ had commandment from the Father. And he said, this commandment I have from my Father, even Christ. Can I tell you something? That Jesus said, I say nothing. I do nothing except as I'm commanded by my Father. Can I tell you something? Heaven has commandments. Why? was Lucifer driven out because he disobeyed the commandment over there. Whether old covenant, new covenant, eternal covenant in heaven, this commandment, you know, when Satan, Lucifer, when he wanted to displace God, I will, I will, I will set my throne above that of God, it was contravening, it was disobeying the commandment of God. God is creator and father. He didn't show that respect unto him when he said, I will steal that throne. He was stealing. He was going to steal the throne of God and then displace God. Even in heaven, they will not accept saying, we're now in heaven. We can do as we like. But you know, Lucifer, he didn't have temptation. He didn't have a tempter rather, but he sinned. And without a tempter, and without the depravity you are talking about, he sinned. He was driven out. And all the angels that disobeyed with him, they were driven out. So there's no corner, and there's no place we can hide and say, well, we're now in the new covenant because of the new covenant. We don't have to respect our Father. Yes, we have to. Ephesians chapter 6. And then uh, we don't have to desist from stealing if we love that thing we can steal no we cannot steal them that stole steal no more Ephesians chapter 4 verse 28 and then we cannot lie now and deceive it says we should not lie one to another because we are members one of another and every liar will be cast into the lake that burns with fire and brimstone we cannot commit adultery now because we are not in the Old Testament after 
after all, we're now in the new covenant. No, we cannot. Because now Christ has even said, you have heard, it was said by them of all, ye shall not commit adultery, but I say unto you, he that looketh upon the woman to lust after her has committed adultery already in his heart. What I'm saying is the word of God is very clear. Can I covet what belongs to my brother? Can I covet what belongs to my sister? No, I cannot because every covetous man is an idolater and ye know that no monger shall have any inheritance in the kingdom of God. The word of God is very clear. The Lord speak these words saying, look at verse 2. In verse 2 it says, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Look at verse 3 there. In verse 3, thou shalt have no other gods before me. It's in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Look at verse 4 there. In verse 4 it says, thou shalt shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Look at verse 5. In verse 5 it says thou shalt not bow down thyself to them. You will not. Whether you are in the Old Covenant or New Testament you will not bow down I serve to any God, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Is he no more jealous now? Can we give the glory that belongs to him, the honor that belongs to him, the worship that belongs to him? Can we give to any other God, any idol, because we are not in the Old Testament? No, he's a jealous God, and he's still looking at that. Do you honor me and love me and reverence me and fear me with all your heart and with all your soul and all your mind? He says, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me. Look at verse 6. In verse 6 it says, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my covenants. Verse 7. Verse 7 says, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God. God in vain. Do you remember the words of Jesus that you'll not swear by the throne of God, by the name of God? You'll not take the name of God in vain. You'll not drag God. God into the mundane things of this life where, you know, talking about you know, I, I saw this ah, didn't it see that way then uh, somebody, I swear unto you cannot do that in the new covenant you will not swear by your head you will not swear by your heart, by your ear, because you cannot turn any white hair there really black, or turn the black uh, to grey you will not swear at all, I Either by heaven, anything in heaven, or by the throne of God in heaven, or by God himself. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. We're looking at verse 8. Verse 8 tells us, remember, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It's giving you all these days to, uh, to work all these days to fend for yourself, all this day to labor for yourself and he says, can you remember me just one day in the week? Can you remember me and, and read my word and sing praises unto me and worship me? And it's not that, you know, you just stay at home, you are, you know, sleeping on the bed. How does that one make you to remember God? You remember God in his word. You remember God as a worship him. You remember God and remember the ways of the Lord. Remember, you're remembering the Lord when you dedicate that time and that period to worshiping him and 
worshiping him alone and you bring your offering and you bring what you are giving to the Lord just to remember Lord you are my creator just remember Lord you are my redeemer just remember Lord you are my preserver just remember Lord you are my protector just remember Lord you are even preparing a place for me in heaven I'm so grateful I offer myself I offer my gifts I offer my possession unto you look at verse 12 in verse 12 it says honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the lord thy god giveth thee we still need to remind our children that this is the first commandment was promised in ephesians chapter 6 reading from verse 1 to verse 3 and any teacher in the school in any country that will teach the children to dishonor their parents, to disregard their parents, and to forget about their parents, and to have their way. Any teacher that does that is teaching against God. Anyone, whether in church or outside church, whether the fellow says, I don't believe in God or I believe in God, anyone that will instigate the children, that will motivate the children, anyone that will kind of uh, uh, make the children disobey their father, disobey their mother. Those the children, they owe everything in life to their parents. And God says, honor them. They brought you into this world, honor them. The mother carried you in the womb, nine months, honor her. And your parents provided when you were very young, you couldn't do anything by yourself, you were totally helpless. Those were the parents that helped you. And whoever you are today, you are, you know, up there, you are an emperor, you are a king, or you are a president, or you are a governor. Whoever you are today, you are an educationist, or you are a professional today. Day is the daddy and the mommy that sacrificed everything and they labored on you before you became what you have become. Now they are aged. Now they cannot do anything for themselves. You will not transfer them into old people's home and forget them there. Who are they? But and when they are sick, you are not visiting them. And when they have problem challenges, you are not remembering them. Even if you claim to be saved and sanctified and filled in the Holy Ghost. I'm very busy. I'm doing the work of God. You are dishonoring your parents. You are disobeying God. And it has consequence. It says, honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long and prolonged upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, thou shalt not kill thou shalt not kill i'm sure you understand if you do anything you don't have to take blade a blade a knife a gun to kill if you withdraw from his mouth what he lives on what his family lives on are you not killing him slowly if you damage his character and you slaughter his character and now he cannot even get any job anywhere you breathe something acidic and corrosive and devastating against him because of that now it's a dying man it's a dying woman and eventually he'll be dead thou shalt not kill if you are pregnant with you know a baby and you say I cannot take care of another baby this one is a mistake which one is a mistake and the Lord has allowed that pregnancy you cannot commit abortion and say well uh, God understands Understands we're in the new covenant, and because we're in the new covenant, we can shed blood. Because we're in the new covenant, we can kill. Because we're in the new covenant, we can murder, and then we can endanger somebody's life and make them to die. No, thou shalt not kill. In verse fourteen, in verse fourteen, thou shalt not commit adultery. You know, you will. If you, adultery does not start the moment you see a woman, or the moment a woman sees a man. It's a process. It's a process. You know, touch the 
this and give this and receive this and text this and do that child. It's a process. And if you don't want to get to the end of the road, why do you start at the beginning of the road? You might say, well, it doesn't matter to me. I'm just I'm a neutral person. And I, I do this. I don't have any ulterior motive. The person you are doing it to, it may not be that strong. It may have all that thing may become temptation unto him or temptation unto her. You know, it doesn't matter to me. I touch anybody. I touch any part of the body. And I don't even think about that. Well, maybe you don't think about that. The person you are touching may be thinking about something else. That's the reason why you don't want to create any lustful condition for anybody with anybody in the public, in the private, in a secret, and in the open. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Reading from verse 15, it says, Thou shalt not steal. And there are many things that people even steal now. They'll take a boy, they'll take a girl and just elope with them and, and just run away with them. Thou shalt not steal. There is, uh, you know, kidnapping, there is uh, human traffic, and there is this and that. As we look outside, that, that's what they are doing. We ourselves need to look inside. You take the attention of a daughter from the parents, and the daughter is always with you, and there's nothing good that you are doing there, and the parents cannot have the enjoyment of their, of their daughter, the enjoyment and the profit of their son. They are always with you. Thou shalt not steal, and then their money, and then their prestige, and their honor, and whatever belongs to them, thou Thou shalt not steal. In verse 16, it says, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. You will not bear false witness against your neighbor. That's lying against your neighbor, getting them into trouble and saying things they have not done. And then you just get them into, into danger. And then in verse 17, it tells us, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his main servant, nor his man made servant and nor his ox nor his ass and uh, anything if anything is missed out and it's okay I don't covet ass I don't covet art I don't uh, covet a man servant I don't covet maid servant you know how people covet maid servant and man servant how much is he paying you I can double that if you find a way to resign from there and cross over to me, I'm telling you, I'm in my own condition of service is better. You are coveting the man servant or the maid servant or the worker of another another person. Or maybe you cover the car, maybe you cover the company, maybe you cover their secretary, maybe you cover whatever belongs to them, and you bribe them and you tip them, and you're always giving them something so that when any problem happens over there, they remember they'll come to my side. If they have not been employed by me and I'm giving them so much money, what if they cross over? They will think by themselves and then I'll give them more. You will not covet anything, anyone that belongs to your neighbor, anything that is their neighbors. As you come to the New Testament, it's all over in the New Testament. In Romans chapter 13, from verse 8 to verse 14, everything is there. We're looking at number 3 here. Number 3, we're looking at the reality of selflessness in good guiltless living. I want to live a good life, a, 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 a guiltless life. And it says, well, consider what belongs to other people. As you look at uh, Exodus 21, Exodus 22, and Exodus 23, it's saying that are you building a house? Build it in such a way that you make the barricade in your, in your pavement so that nobody will fall down and die. Do you have a farm? Don't have 
allow your ox to go to another another farmer's ox and then eat up what they have do you have an ass don't allow the property of the animal of the other person to kill your neighbor's say animal it's just saying that you should be conscious of what other people have and then if your ox has killed another person's ox you'll make for it you make restitution for that and you will not allow your neighbor to suffer the loss of property by your own carelessness or by your cruelty. And then in the New Testament, we're told in Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 23, Matthew chapter 5, verse 23, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother has ought against thee. Look at verse 24. It says, Leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. If we measure people's life by those two verses alone, how many Christians do we really have? How many followers of Christ do we really have? How many saved, righteous people do we really have? How many sanctified people do we really have? People offend each other. And they offend people that you wouldn't think they'll want to offend. The people that might be generous to them or good to them or gracious to them. And yet, they just offend. And then when it, I'm going to the Sabbath, they carry their Bible. Maybe they're going to preach. Maybe they're going to teach. They keep on teaching. They keep on preaching. Maybe they're going to lead prayer. They keep on leading their prayer. They don't mind all that offense against their fellow brother, against their wife against their husband and if anybody talks about that they frown at the person that talks about the restitution and the righteousness and making right what was wrong if they made right what was wrong at all they do it so that they will have position they will have recognition uh -uh. we don't make restitution because of having position because of having restitution having recognition we make restitution upon because in the commandment of the lord number two because if somebody offended us what we would have wanted him to do is come and make right what he had done wrong and also because of getting to heaven that if my gift will not be accepted here Will he accept my person if I'm, I have a lot piled up in my heart? Offend this, offend this, step on that person's toe, and step on that person's, even not only toe, you st step upon their throat, and yet you're still you're on your way to heaven. No, Jesus said, leave thy gift before the altar, and go thy way, and be reconciled to thy brother. Then after that you can come and offer thy gift. I pray God will open the eyes of our heart that we will do what is right and then we know that we're Christians we're real children of God and we're obedient to the word of God I'm coming to point number two here point number two we're looking at sanctified for godliness in this world sanctified for godliness in this world Exodus chapter 19 I'm reading from verse 4 it says in Exodus 19 verse 4 ye have a sin, what I did unto the Egyptians because of you, and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, if you will obey my voice indeed, in truth, in reality, from the depth of your heart. Then ye shall, and ye shall keep my covenant. Then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Look at verse 6. In verse 6 it says, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. First Peter, reading from chapter 2. 
verses 5 and 9. First Peter chapter 2, verse 5. He also, as lively stones, a built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Christ, by Jesus Christ. In verse 9, in verse 9 it says, But she, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that he should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness, no secrecy again. He called you out of darkness. And then he says he's called you into his marvelous light. Look at three things here. Number one, number one, set apart purposefully for God and for good. Now you are saved and you come before him and you set yourself apart because he has worked on you. And he has brought you unto himself. Because of that now, you are purposefully set apart for God and only for good. Number two, sanctified and purified for godliness by God. Number three, submissive and possessed by the God of all grace. Look at number one. Number one, we're looking at set apart purposefully for God for good. It tells us in Leviticus chapter 20, reading here from verse 7. Leviticus chapter 20, reading from verse 7, sanctify yourselves, set yourself apart, consecrate yourself, therefore, for ye that she and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. Look at verse 8, in verse 8, and ye shall keep my statutes and do them, for I am the Lord which sanctify you. In verse 7, sanctify yourself, set yourself apart. And then in verse 8, I am the Lord that sanctify you. Look at Psalm, Psalm 4, we're looking at verse 3. In Psalm 4, verse 3, it tells us, but know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. He has set apart him that is godly for himself. Anyone that is not set apart for God is not godly. Because if God saw that you were graciously saved, and you were also graciously sanctified, and you belong to him, I took you on eagle's wings, and I brought you unto myself. He would have made sure that you are set apart. No, that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Look at verse 4 there. In verse 4, stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. We're looking at number two there. Number two is sanctified and purified for godliness by God. In John chapter 17, verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Then in verse 19, verse 19 says, for their sakes I sanctify myself. I set myself apart. I'm willing to go through the sacrifice that they also might be sanctified through thy truth. It tells us in um, Ephesians chapter 5, uh, reading from verse 25, it says, us must love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, that he gave himself for the church. Why? In verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it. This is the second meaning and the important meaning, experiential meaning of the word sanctify, to sanctify and cleanse the church by the washing of water by the word. Then in verse 27, it says that he might present it to himself, present that church to himself, set apart, sanctified, purified, 
purged, made holy, and now is presented to Christ, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any sort of thing, but that it should be holy sanctification, it should be holy, sanctified, cleansed, that it should be holy and without blemish. You'll be without blemish. We shall be without blemish. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Look at number three here. Number three, submissive and possessed by the God of all grace. He, he, now we're submissive to him and we're possessed by him. He lives in us, Christ living in you, the hope of glory. And then he says, I touch no unclean thing, and be ye separate, and I will dwell in them, and I will walk in them. He possesses us. He said, the comforter, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, but you know him because he is with you and shall be in you. The Father in us, the Christ, the Son, Savior, Lord is in us and also the Spirit in us. We are possessed by the God of all grace. We're coming to Titus chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 14. Titus chapter 2 verse 14 who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. It tells us in Romans chapter 14, we're reading from verse 7. Romans chapter 14, verse 7, for none of us liveth unto himself. Now that we are totally set apart for him and we're sanctified by him and we submit unto him, none of us live it to himself and no man dies to himself. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, for whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord. Lords will belong to the Lord and he possesses us. I pray he'll possess you. His power will possess you. His grace will possess you. And all the goodness of the Lord will possess us in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three now. Point number three, satisfied with goodness beyond the wilderness. Yes, in the wilderness, it will satisfy us. Everything we need, water out of the rock, it will satisfy us. Manna out of heaven, it will satisfy us. And victory over all foes and enemies he'll satisfy us and then the joy of the Lord being our strength it will satisfy us even with long life it will satisfy us because he what you are saved he sanctifies and he sanctifies with goodness beyond the wilderness both in the wilderness and beyond the wilderness we're looking at um, Exodus chapter 23 and I'm reading from verse 22 Exodus chapter 23 verse 22 but if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak then I will be an enemy unto your enemies no enemy will overcome your life and then he says he says and then an adversary unto thine adversaries Somebody, you know, said in one of the meetings I went to, he said, and you know, the louder your amen, the greater your miracle. Then in verse, we're looking at verse 25, in verse 25, and you shall serve the Lord your God. Are you serving the Lord? I said, are you serving the Lord? He will bless you. He will satisfy you. All those heartaches and all those problems, he'll wipe away from your life in Jesus' name. And you shall serve the Lord your God. And he shall bless thy bread and thy water. Even every, oh, the only thing you have to drink is water. He'll bless that water. All the nutrients and everything that other things should have supplied will be supplied in your body, in your life in Jesus' name. And then he says, and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. I claim that. I claim that. You will be healthy. 
you'll be strong. And then it says in verse 26, in verse 26, there shall nothing cast their young. Uh, be careful now, be careful now. I know so and so who lost this and that is not telling you to look at so and so. He's saying uh, that the peculiar and special blessing it will bring upon your life. Uh, have you noticed there are some promises in the Bible that many, many people did not, they did not go through, they did not realize, but uh, there were people that said, even if others have not experienced age, that promise belongs to me, I will experience it. I'm talking about you there. Do you remember Isaiah said, when you pass through the water, you'll not be drowned, and when you pass through the fire, and you'll not be burnt, and nobody claimed that. Nobody realized that. Here comes Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And Nebuchadnezzar said, I'll throw you into the furnace of fire. And then they remembered that promise that nobody has claimed. I claim it today. I claim it today. It says, there shall nothing cast their young, nor be barren in their land. The number of thy days I will fulfill. The number of your days it will fulfill. Look at verse 27. In verse 27, I will say in my fear before thee, and I will destroy all the people to whom thou shalt come, and I will make all thine enemies to turn their backs unto you. They will run back. All their purposes to get you and grab you and destroy you, uh-uh, it will not happen. Three things we're looking at here. Number one, number one, the conditional promise of God's goodness. Number two, the continual provocation with the grievous godlessness. Number three, the consistent peculiar people with great grace. Look at number one. Number one is the conditional promise of God's goodness. That's what we have read now in Exodus chapter 23. The conditional promise of the Lord is there and that promise is yours from today all your days in Jesus name. We're looking at Job chapter 36 in Job chapter 36 verse 11 if they obey and serve him they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures it will be fulfilled in your life in Jesus' name. But you see the condition there. If they obey and serve him, look at verse 12. In verse 12, but if they obey not, they shall perish by the sword and they shall die without knowledge. I will not perish. I will not die by the sword. I'll be obedient to the Lord and the blessings of the Lord will multiply your life in Jesus' name. Look at number two here. Number two here is the continual provocation with their grievous godlessness. Those children of Israel that the Lord had given them such great promise, marvelous promise, instead of obeying the Lord, they provoked the Lord. And as they provoked the Lord, it was was to their own damnation. We're looking at Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32. We're looking at verse 8. Exodus 32 verse 8. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and they have sacrificed thereunto and said the these be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt. That was provoking the Lord. Look at verse 31. In verse 31, it tells us, And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, these people have sinned a great sin, and have made them gods of gold. Verse 32, verse 32, Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, 
Did he finish the sentence? And if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of the book which thou hast written. Look at verse 33. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever have sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. The Lord is not happy with those who provoke him by their sinning. Well, will not provoke the Lord. I will not provoke the Lord. The blessings of God will continue in your life in Jesus' name. We're coming to number three here. Number three here is the consistent, peculiar people with great grace. The people who say, God has grace. He has sufficient grace. He has abundant grace. He has great grace. And I'm going to key into that. And every day of my life, every situation in my life, I'm going to have the grace of God. And those people are the people that remain peculiar in the kingdom of God and they have the blessings of God upon them. Uh, let's look at uh, Titus chapter 2 and I'm reading from verse 14. Titus chapter 2 verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works and the door is open for everyone everyone whatever i have been in the past whatever you have been in the past we can come to god today and say lord i want to experience that peculiar touch of god the peculiar grace of god so that my life now will be full of grace abundant in the grace of god and i'll be living to the glory of your name other people got the great grace before now it's your turn I said, now it's your turn. I'm looking at First Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 9. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation. The Lord has chosen me. I said, the Lord has chosen me. How about you? How about you? The Lord has chosen you. Grace will be upon your life great grace upon your life. Yeah, chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people that he should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy but now I've obtained mercy. Now I have obtained mercy. Now you have obtained mercy. I will shine forth in that mercy of God in Jesus' name. Don't turn to the path. Don't look at the back, at the things at the back. Now around you, grace before you grace and around you the power of god everything you need to satisfy and to please the lord the lord will supply in your life and look at verse 11 in verse 11 it says dearly beloved i beseech you as strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly laws which war against the soul and then in verse 12 in verse 12 it says having your compassion Conversation honest among the Gentiles that whereas they speak against you as evil doers, ye may, ye may by your good works which they shall behold glorify God in the day of visitation. People will glorify God for you on that final day. The manifestation of the grace of God in your life, the goodness of God in your life, and the approach that you take to life, just pleasing the Lord one day at a time, one moment at a time, you rejoice in eternity in Jesus' name. Now, with the grace of God in our lives, look at verse 21. In verse 21, for even here unto what ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, suffered for you, leaving you an example, leaving us an example that ye shall follow his steps. As the Lord Jesus submitted to the Father and he did everything that pleased the Father every time. You know you are submitting 
submissive to the Lord and the Lord will grant you all the help you need and you'll be obedient to the Lord and great will be the blessing of the Lord upon your life from now on forever in Jesus name let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer and say Lord I thank you for grace available grace abundant and great grace that is now made available for me and all that you have commanded I want to be able to do and the Lord will give you the strength and the power the enablement to be everything you ought to be for the glory of God please open your mouth to the Lord in real prayer of faith and the Lord will fill your life to overflowing